Okay, so I'm going to talk, to talk to you today about a very specific uh, type of uh, horizontal beam transfer, which is called the endosymbiotic beam transfer, which is something that is very, very common in photosynthetic eukaryotes. So, as you know very well, there are very different types of photosynthetic, well, for photosynthetic eukaryotes, ranging from very big trees or macroalgae to also a lot of uh, different species of unicellular algae like this diatom or euglena or digoflagellates. So photosynthetic eukaryotes are very diverse, but they can be grouped into two major groups according to uh, one characteristic of their plastids, their chloroplast or plastids, which is the number of membranes. So there are photosynthetic eukaryotes that have plastids with only two membranes and these are found in uh, green algae and green plants, in red algae and in a small group of algae that, uh, that is called the glucophytes. So these uh, three groups are thought to have acquired their plastids by the endosymbiosis of a cyanobacterium within a uh, heterotrophic eukaryotic host. So this event is now believed to have happened only once. So this, uh, it is accepted by almost everybody that, that these three groups are monophyletic. So that there was a single ancestor that acquired this cyanobacterium and then give rise to the three groups, Viridiplantae, Rhodophyta, and Glaucophyta. And in addition to these photosynthetic uh, groups, there are other, there is a very large diversity of other eukaryotes that have plastids with more than two membranes. And in this case, what happened was that a uh, eukaryotic uh, host, a uh, heterotrophic eukaryotic cell, engulfed a uh, an algae that already contains a plastid. So we know examples of uh, eukaryotic uh, algae, eukaryotic uh, species that contain plastids derived from red algae or from green algae. So in this case, uh, what uh, you have at the end is the two membranes that were originally present in the plastid and also the third membrane that was the membrane of the algae. And sometimes you can have additional membranes that correspond, for example, for the, to the food back wall that engulfed this algae. And this can be really very complex because sometimes you can have this secondary endosymbiotic algae that are again engulfed by another host. And you can have very complex situations where at the end you can have a lot of membranes and a very complex system of endomembranes in the, in the final uh, eukaryotic species. But in general, there are these two types, so plastids with two membranes or plastids with more than two membranes. And this uh, secondary endosymbiosis, as you tell, as I have uh, told you, are known with red algae and with green algae, so there are at least four groups of eukaryotes that that have plastids derived from uh, red algae. This is what uh, we call the red line. So these are found in alveolites, in heterocons or estaminophytes, in cryptophytes and also in aptophytes. And there are only two groups of uh, eukaryotes that contain uh, secondary plastids, secondary endosymbiotic plastids derived from uh, red algae. These are the chloraragnophytes and the euglenids which form the green line. So if you place these different eukaryotes in a phylogenetic tree, you can see that they are very dispersed, very widespread in the phylogenetic eukaryotes because they occupy most of the, they can be found in a large portion of the eukaryotic tree. And this phylogenetic, uh, this phylogenetic analysis uh, provide, uh, provides some information about the origin of these uh, photosynthetic groups. So one thing, as I told you, which is 
now uh, accepted by almost everybody is that this primary endosymbiosis, the acquisition of a cyanobacterium <laughs> by an uh, eukaryotic host, occurred only once to give rise to the green plants, the red algae and the glaucophytes. It is also accepted that there were two independent secondary endosymbiosis with green algae, one in the euglenids and one in the chlorarabinophytes. And we don't know exactly how many uh, endosymbioses occurred with red algae. Maybe uh, there is a lot of debate um, on this uh, topic today. There are people that say that maybe there was only one endosymbiosis and people that say that maybe there were many endosymbioses with red algae. So this is an open question in the concerning the phylogeny of eukaryotes. And there is a lot of work to be done to resolve it. Okay, and going to the to the topic of my talk, uh, when people began to study and to sequence genomes from uh, different plastids, from um, different uh, photosynthetic eukaryotes, they realized a very interesting thing. <coughs> there is that in all cases, these plastids, uh, this genome, these plastid genomes tend to be very small. So they are just uh, about from 30 to 200 kilobases, and they encode for a relatively small number of proteins, which range from 20 to 200 different proteins. However, when you look at uh, cyanobacterial genomes, they are much bigger. They range from almost 2 to more than 9 uh, megabases and they encode for very large number of uh, protein of pro different proteins from 2,000 up to seven or eight thousand uh, different proteins. So there is a, big, a very big difference between the cyanobacteria and the plastid genomes. And also another thing that is uh, very well known it does is uh, that. Uh, Plastids contain many more proteins than those that are encoded by their uh, genomes. And in fact, to make a plastid uh, uh, function, you need many more proteins than those that are encoded by their genomes. So there is something strange happening here. And this is the fact that many of the uh, genes that were initially in the genome of the plastids have been transferred to the nucleus of the, uh, endos of the uh, host. This is what is called endosymbiotic gene transfer. And initially, you have a very big typical cyanobacterial genome. But then, thanks to this transfer of genes towards the nucleus, you end up with a small uh, plastid genome and many genes of the plastid that are located in the nucleus. In the case of secondary endosymbiosis, you have the same, but this time what you have uh, is a lot of transfers <coughs> from the nucleus of the, of the secondary endosymbiont of the red or green algae. These genes are transferred to the nucleus of the new eukaryotic host. So at the end, you have very complex uh, genomes with genes <coughs> of different origins. You have genes which are typical eukaryotic genes of the host, genes that are transferred from the nucleus of the secondary uh, endosymbiont, and also genes from the primary cyanobacterial endosymbiont. So this makes uh, this makes very, very, very complex. <coughs> and um, when these uh, genomes have been sequenced, and uh, or genes or from these genomes have been sequenced, or these complete genomes have been sequenced, people began to carry out phylogenetic analysis, and this allowed to retrace the evolutionary history of these genes. And in some cases, you can very very easily uh, demonstrate that these genes are in fact, uh, has been in fact uh, acquired by endosymbiotic gene transfer from the initial 
cyanobacterial endosymbiont. This is the case, for example, for this gene. And in the phylogeny, you have plants. You have the chloroplast from, uh, from green plants, or also from the algae. And they are the sister, they are the branch together with cyanobacteria. So this is a typical gene that now it is located in the nucleus, but that originally was located in the cyanobacterial endosymbiont. And now, with the, thanks to the fact that now there are many complete genome sequences for a diversity of uh, algae and other and plants, uh, it has been possible to try to quantify how many genes in a complete genome of these photosynthetic eukaryotes have been acquired by endosymbiotic gene transfer. And it was a big surprise to see that uh, these genes represent a very large fraction of the complete genomes of this species. For example, in the case of Arabidopsis, Martin and co-workers uh, were able to show that about almost 20% of the complete genome of Arabidopsis, that is more than 4,000 proteins, were acquired from the plastid. So this is a very big contribution to the nuclear genome of this plant. And this is probably the case for all the uh, uh, different uh, a species of photosynthetic eukaryotes. Another thing which is very interesting about uh, the analysis of these genes that have been transferred from uh, photosynthetic endosymbionts <laughs> is that this can help to identify the presence of what we call cryptic endosymbionts. That is, a species that are no longer photosynthetic, they do not carry out uh, photosynthesis, but they still contain genes of uh, photosynthetic endosymbionts in their genomes. The photosynthesis has been, has been lost, but the genes are still there. And this is a case, for example, for cryptosporidium, which is a parasite. But uh, this gene, the leucine aminopeptidase, when you uh, look at the phylogeny of this gene, you can see cryptosporidium and other parasites that are closely related to uh, sequences from plants and from uh, cyanobacteria. So this indicates that all these parasites, once in their past, they contain a photosynthetic endosymbiont, and that photosynthesis was, was lost secondarily. Another example, which is very well known, is the case of apicomplexa. So for example, toxoplasma. Toxoplasma is no longer it's a parasite. It is not photosynthetic, but it still contains a, a very small organelle, which is now, uh, it has been demonstrated that it derives from a photosynthetic plastids, and this organelle still contains a, a, a genome, a circular chromosome, which is called the apicoplast DNA, and there are several genes in this, uh, in this chromosome, and the phylogeny of these genes demonstrate demonstrates that the, this apicoplast derived from what was uh, in the past a photosynthetic uh, chloroplast. Another example, for example, in Pertinsus marinus, which is a parasitic algalate, which is, is a parasite of oysters. There are several genes in the genome of Pertinsus, which is not photosynthetic, but there are several genes in, this, in, the genome, in the genome of this species that are closely related to genes of algae and of cyanobacteria. So it has been speculated that Perkinsus was also uh, derived from photosynthetic ancestors. So there are, today there are many cases of this type of cryptic endosymbiosis that have been revealed thanks to the analysis of endosymbiotic gene transferred genes. And now, thanks to the availability of uh, complete genome sequences, this type of analysis is not based on the phylogenetic analysis of individual genes, but on the on massive phylogenetic analysis of complete genomes. And this has been done recently. And this has uh, led to very surprising results. And I will discuss, you, uh, I will discuss with you, uh, in particular, this case, which concerns the presence of the possible presence of a green cryptic plastid in diatoms, which was uh, published by Mustafa co workers in Science 
a few years ago. So this study was based on the analysis of a couple of uh, diatom genomes from two different diatom species. So what the authors uh, did was to take all the proteins encoded by these genomes and to uh, look for uh, homologous sequences in sequence databases to reconstruct data sets for each uh, protein to carry out phylogenetic tree reconstruction and then to apply a method, an automatic method, to filter the phylogenetic trees to see, to look for the origin, for the evolutionary origin of each one of these proteins. And the big surprise was this one because, as you know, diatoms are photosynthetic eukaryotes that contain plastids that are derived from red algae. So this is clear, these plastids contain typical um, pigments of red algae and the phylogeny of the genes that are in the genome of the plastids is clearly of, uh, demonstrates clearly that these uh, plastids derive from red algae. However, Mustafa et al. with this analysis discovered that many more genes coming apparently from green algae and green plants than genes coming from red algae. So this was a surprise. And the, the conclusion was that maybe in the past diatoms contained a green algal endosymbiont that was later replaced by a red algal endosymbiont. So they call that a trace of a cryptic green algal endosymbiont endosymbiosis in diatoms. So uh, in our group there is uh, one person that was very interested in, the, in this type of uh, endosymbiotic relationships and he was very interested by uh, the analysis of this, uh, of this result because uh, we suspected that maybe there is a, there is a problem in here because it is, very, it is very strange that you find many more genes from something that has been lost than genes from something that, are, that is still present in the in these uh, diatoms, so we decided to uh, to reanalyze this data, and in particular, we detected two possible problems in this analysis. One problem is that there are many more complete genome sequences available for green plants and green algae than for red algae. This is just because people have sequenced many more uh, plants and green algae than red algae. And when you look at the you know, at the database that was that was used for that analysis, there were in that database there were only eleven thousand proteins from red algae and almost two hundred thousand proteins for green algae and green plants. So we decided to test if the result that was published by these uh, authors was just due to the fact that there, there was a very strong disequilibrium between the number of genes available for comparisons coming from red algae or coming from um, green plants and green algae. So if this result was true, if, if we in reanalyzed this data and we added and we add many more uh, proteins coming from red algae, this has not to change, it has to remain the same. Another thing that we wanted to test is was the automatic filtering of the trees. Because trees can be very complex, so very often you can have very complex trees with paralogs with different families, or trees that are not well resolved, so it is really very difficult to establish an automatic way to filter trees. So we decided to, to have a visual look of each one of the trees to see if it was the inference of the red algal or green algal origin was correct or not. So first, what we did was to try to increase as much as possible the uh, sampling of red algal proteins in the database. So we were looking for red algal sequences in all possible databases and we were able to almost double the number of red proteins in the database and we also carried out 
a visual inspection of all the trees. So we reconstructed again all the trees for all the data diatom proteins with these new sequences available, and we have and we looked to all these trees. So this was a lot of work because the, there were several thousands of trees, and we have very different situations, but we were able to classify the trees in several categories. There were many, many trees that we called poor sampling trees, like this one, where you have a protein, and when you blast, when you, when you look for homologs of this protein in databases, you see that there are only very few homologs for the protein. For example, in this case, when you have diatoms, the two species of diatom, no, only one species of diatom, and just a couple of uh, green algae, one red algae, and another completely unrelated eukaryote. These trees are extremely difficult to interpret. You, you, when this type of tree, you cannot say if this gene of, uh, in this diatom is really coming from uh, green algae of, or not. It's really difficult. There is no information there. There were also many, many trees that we called unresolved just because it was very poorly supported, so the statistical support for the tree was very weak. And in addition, the, the tree was, the uh, groups in the tree were not well resolved. For example, in this tree, you have here stramenopines with all the diatoms here, but you have here one group of fungi and another group of fungi here, and then green plants and green algae, and the, these fungi that are in the middle between diatoms and green algae. Once again, with this tree, you cannot say that this gene was acquired from green algae by these staminopines. Maybe it was the case, but maybe not. And with this information, it is impossible to, to decide. And also, we retrieved many genes that were genes that have a very typical uh, eukaryotic phylogeny, we can say, that we call eukary typical eukaryotic genes where we have phylogenies that were those expected for, for eukaryotes without any endosymbiosis or endosymbiotic gene transfer, like this one, when you have uh, staminopiles, alveolates, green plants and green algae, and not a direct relationship between diatoms and the green algae. So once again, with this tree, you cannot say that this gene has been acquired by diatoms from green algae. And finally, we also observed several cases where, in fact, we have evidence for endosymbiotic gene transfer, but surprisingly, in several cases, despite uh, it was published that these genes were acquired from green algae, what we observed was the contrary, was that the diatoms were more closely related to red algae, as expected, because they have red algal plastids, than to green algae. So this is a, 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 what we call endosymbiotic gene transfer, and we, call the, we classify this one as a red case because it supported a red algal origin for this gene. So at the beginning, we had this data, and after our analysis, we obtained these results. So, for most of the genes uh, analyzed, we have either typical eukaryotic genes without any evidence of endosymbiotic gene transfer, or poor sampling genes that were impossible to, uh, to make, uh, to put in the category of endosymbiotic gene transfer or not, and a relatively large number of completely unresolved trees and only a very small or relatively small proportion of genes that really, of uh, phylogenies that really supported the uh, endosymbiotic gene transfer acquisition of these genes by diatoms. However, they were not all of them of green origin, and in fact, among these endosymbiotic gene transfer genes, we have one third that was unresolved, the genes were, in fact, were closely related 
the diatom genes were closely related to red algae and green algae, but it was difficult to say if they were more closely related to the red ones or green ones. But even if they were clear cases of endosymbiotic gene transfer, and we have one third of them that were uh, of red algal origin, and about one third that were uh, of clear or putative green algal origin. So I, we begin. We began this analysis with about almost 4,000 genes that were supposed to have been acquired from green algae. Yeah, the, uh, but at the end, we have about 90 of these genes that, in fact, appear to have been acquired from green algae. However, we have a still a very limited uh, sampling of red algal uh, genes because there are still very few red algal genomes that have been sequenced. So we, and, but just by the addition of these new ones that we were able to add to the analysis, we reduced the number of green genes from more than 3,000 to only uh, 89. So we expect that if we continue adding new red algal uh, genes to the database, probably this number will still decrease and at the end we will have only uh, endosymbiotic gene transfers of red algae as it is expected. So there was a very similar example uh, published uh, more or less at the same time. So the, it concerns Chromeriabelia, which is uh, an spe um, algal species which is related to Apicomplexa. And uh, in this case, again, the plastids in this uh, species are clearly of red algal origin. They have pigments of red algal type, and there is no doubt about the red algal nature of the plastids in, in Chromera. But in this analysis, which was based on uh, transcriptome, transcriptome data for this species, the, these authors detected about 500 endosymbiotic gene transfer uh, cases, and about 50% of them of red algal origin and 50% of green algal origin. So once again, it was uh, speculated that maybe this uh, species in, the, in its past have had a plastic, uh, green algal plastic that was later replaced by a red algal plastic. However, these, uh, these people, they analyze this data more or less in the same way as we reanalyze the data of diatoms, and they have very similar results from the 500 endosymbiotic gene transfers. At the end, they were able only to say there are only 51 of those genes that are really endosymbiotic gene transfers, and there is a larger proportion of red algal ones than of those of apparent uh, green algal origin. So once again, it appeared that there is not very real, strong evidence of a green algal endosymbiont <coughs> in this species. So when we were looking at uh, these genes uh, in diatoms, uh, we, uh, we detected several cases that were very interesting because in general they were very clear. So they were the best genes that we have because they provide <coughs> a very clear answer. And these are the genes for which we have what we call a complete endosymbiotic gene transfer history. These are the genes that have homologs in cyanobacteria and homologs also in red algae and green algae and green plants and in the group that we were interested in, the diatoms. So these are genes that originated in the primary plastid, in the cyanobacterium that uh, gave rise to the first endosymbiotic uh, photosynthetic plastid that were then transferred secondarily to red algae and to uh, green algae and then transferred again to diatoms. And as I told you, this, in general, these genes provided very, very nice phylogenies. So in the case of diatoms, there were 209 and nine of these genes 
and almost two thirds of these genes were clearly of renal origin and only a few ones appeared to be of renal origin. So once again, this support this supports very strongly that the, in diatoms, the strong endosymbiotic gene transfer signal is coming from red algae and not from green algae. So, as I told you, these are very important genes for plastic function. These are, for example, ribosomal uh, proteins that are uh, working in the, plast in the plastic or genes that are involved in the synthesis of uh, pigments of chlorophylls and other pigments. So these are genes that are essential for, uh, the, for plastic function. And because they are essential, they are very well conserved and they produce very nice phy phylogenetic trees. So we had uh, this list. We have established this list of genes. So we were curious to see if uh, what happens with these genes in the other groups of photosynthetic eukaryotes. So among these uh, about 200 genes that we detected in diatoms, there are about 120 that are very well represented in the diversity of the different groups of photosynthetic eukaryotes. So we analyzed them in all these uh, photosynthetic eukaryotes, and I will show you several examples. For example, this gene, which is present inside a bacteria, and a very wide diversity of photosynthetic eukaryotes, including estaminopiles, aptophytes, cryptophytes, uh, euglenids, and chloraraniophytes. And here you have a typical case, which is what we can expect from a gene that has been acquired by uh, primary and secondary endosymbiosis. So the gene is present in glaucophytes, rhodophytes, and really plantae, that is the three groups that acquire the first uh, uh, plastic derived from cyanobacteria and then it has been transferred secondarily to different to other eukaryotes, estaminopiles, aptophytes and uh, cryptophytes, really closely related to uh, rhodophytes as expected because all these groups contain plastids that are of red algal type and Euglenoids and chloraragnophytes related to green algae, which is expected because these two groups contain plastids that are of uh, green algal type. So this is what you expect to see in, in phylogenetic trees of endosymbiotic gene transfer genes. And in fact, in several groups, estaminopiles, aptophytes and cryptophytes and also in apicomplexa. In fact, we have a very strong red algal signal for these genes and only a few cases of genes that maybe have been acquired from green algae. But these are always less than 10%. So maybe these genes are not real endosymbiotic gene transfer uh, examples. Maybe they are just uh, genes that have some problems of uh, what we call phylogenetic noise, maybe these are just typical or regular horizontal gene transfers, not necessarily endosymbiotic gene transfers, yet just gene transfers between different eukaryotic species without endosymbiosis, or maybe other phylogenetic problems, for example, related to hidden paralogies or other problems. But there is, what is important here is the very strong red signal in all cases. However, there were uh, several genes that were very surprising because we observed things like, uh, like this one. So once again, cyanobacteria, red algae, glaucophytes, and green algae and green plants, uh, estaminopiles, uh, cryptophytes, closely related to red algae, as expected, but also uh, Chloraragnophytes here, the yellow weather, and euglenoids, euglena, closely related to red algae, with very, very good statistical support. So, this is a very well resolved tree. And here, another case, also very well resolved, 
cyanobacteria, red algae, green algae and green plants, glycophytes, and staminophytes, uh, cryptophytes and aptophytes, closely related to red algae, as expected, but also here, uh, chlorarethnophytes and eulenoids, closely related to red algae, which is surprising. The problem was that uh, there was there were a lot of data for uh, chlorare chlorarachnophytes because there there was a complete genome sequence from for one species, Bigelowella, but there were very few data available for Eulena. So to to complete or to increase the database for this species, we have sequenced the transcriptome of Eulena gracilis. And this has uh, allowed us to increase the number of genes available for this species. So there were 32 of these genes of cyanobacterial origin, and one. And now we have 70 genes, uh, new genes. So we have 100 of the 120 that we were analyze, analyzing. And this is the result of the phylogenetic analysis for these two groups of eukaryotes that have secondary uh, green plastids. We have about 50% of the endosymbiotic gene transfers in the two cases that are of green algal origin as expected, but we have also a little bit more than 50% or yes, almost a little bit more uh, genes of clear red algal origin than genes of green algal origin in both chlorarachnophytes and eulenids. So there is more or less 50% of the two types, which was something completely unexpected. So what we think here is that maybe in this case we have real evidence for a cryptic endosymbiosis of a red algal, of red algal plastids in these two groups that today have uh, green algal plastids and that this uh, uh, green al red algae have been lost and today what we see are the green algal plastids but in the past there was a green algal endosymbiote in the two groups and this is not completely <coughs> new because other people have already mm, seen this, although in a more reduced uh, scale, because they have been uh, looking at specific genes, we, what we have done is to look as, as, at as many genes as possible. But there are already several examples that have been published, both in eugleniates and in eugleniates and chloraneophytes, saying that maybe in the past there was first a red algae that was acquired by these two groups and that it was later replaced by a, a green algae. So this is the end of my talk, uh, but what I wanted to, to discuss today was in particular the difficulty to identify the endosymbiotic gene transfers because uh, it is on the one hand when it is a real endosymbiotic gene transfer, sometimes it is very difficult to be sure that it is coming from red algae or from green algae because red algae and green algae are sister groups. They are very closely related in phylogenies, so it is not very difficult if there is some phylogenetic noise or if there is some phylogenetic uh, problems. It is very easy to pass from one group to the other. So you need to rely only on very well resolved phylogenies to uh, identify this type of uh, endosymbiotic gene transfers. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, this is, today this is impossible to do that in a fully automatic uh, uh, way because uh, all automatic procedures to reconstruct trees and to, to filter trees may, detect, may have uh, a lot of errors and may detect a lot of uh, for many false uh, positives. So what we have seen also is that those genes that have the complete endosymbiotic gene transfer history, that is, genes that are originally from cyanobacteria, then transferred into the primary photosynthetic eukaryotes and then into the secondary photosynthetic eukaryotes, in general they produce very nice 
phylogenies. So I think they are the best markers to analyze this type of, uh, of questions. And the, the, the big surprise has been that uh, these genes appear to support that the groups that the two groups that today have uh, <coughs> plastids of green secondary origin, probably in the past they had uh, plastids of red algal type, which is a, a surprise. So thank you very much for your attention. questions at the moment then uh, let's just complete the official part and uh, maybe some questions are coming afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>